Welcome back students see this is anatomy and in this session we are going to look about the elements of osteology. The notes for this session they were prepared by the Dr. Kawishe, the former doctor in the Department of Anatomy at Mumbai University of Health and Allied Science. The facilitator in this session, I am Helbert Mlelo, a student at Mumbai University of Health and Allied Science. In the previous session, we looked at the language of anatomy and we discussed different aspects about the language of anatomy. So if you didn't view the section, uh, just go to the session, look at the session first before attending this session because most of the terminologies uh, which we will be using in this section, uh, they are present or they are explained in the first session. Now, first you should know that the osteology is the study of bones, the study of bones, and here we have the human skeleton uh, positioned in different positions. So, elements of osteology, osteology is the anatomical study of bones, anatomical study of bones. Bone is the rigidly dense connective tissue that consists of cell, fibers, and the matrix. So, a bone is hard because of who? Classification of its extracellular matrix. So, uh, classification is done by by the calcium elements. And if we if we could remove the calcium from bones, that is, if could, classification could not occur, bones could not be hard again. So, simply osteology is the study of bones. Then elements of osteology. So, in osteology, actually, we are studying about the human skeleton or about the bones of the human skeleton so as you can see this is the human skeleton uh, we have the the scar here then from there we have the bones of the upper rim we have humerus then you have um, radius and the ulna uh, then from there we have the vertebral column we have the ribs we have the sternum here uh, we have the uh, this pubic bone uh, we have the femur and then you have um, the bones of the leg. So the human skeleton is the internal framework of the body. The human body has 206 bones. The axial skeleton has 80 bones and the appendicular skeleton has 126 bones. So we have two types, major two types of skeleton. That is axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton. And as you can see here, the axial skeleton has few bones as compared to the appendicular skeleton. So note, at birth, the body has around uh, 300 bones, but this number decreases to 206 bones by attitude after some bones have fused together. So this is the one of the point you need to consider uh, when you are studying about the skeleton. You need to know the number of bones uh, in childhood uh, decreases decreases from birth to altitude, they decrease from 300 to 260. So that's all about the division of the skeleton. Actually, uh, the axial skeleton uh, is from the head and neck, and then we have ribs and sternum, vertebral column, up to the hip bone. This is known as the axial skeleton. And the appendicular skeleton uh, is made up actually of limbs, these which attach from the axial skeleton. So appendicular skeleton uh, is made up of the upper limb and the lower limb, which are the attachments from the axial skeleton. So actually appendicular skeleton is attached to the axial skeleton. So to make a division of human skeleton, uh, we have axial skeleton, axial skeleton components, the scar, hyoid bone, vertebral column, ribs, and sternum. Then the appendicular skeleton uh, component you have bones of the upper and the lower limb and shoulder together with the pelvic guido. So that's the division of the skeleton. And uh, as you can see here, uh, this diagram showed the axial skeleton and this diagram showed the uh, appendicular skeleton. So the skeleton which is in color like yellow is the one which is considered. So the axial skeleton from scar vertebral column, then sternum, ribs, that is axial skeleton, and hyoid bone, which is present uh, in the scar. 
Also, uh, in the pendicular skeleton, as you can see, a pendicular skeleton, here we are considering this structure which are labeled in color like black. So, from the bones of the upper limb, bones of the shoulder, bones of the pelvic giddle, and the bones of the lower limb, they are appendicular skeleton. Then, from there, uh, let's touch, let's touch a little about the function of human skeleton. First, it supports uh, the body. Then, it is involved in the movement, involved in the protection of uh, organs such as lungs. They are protected by the ribs and the brain is protected by, by the scar. Then, production of blood cells. And this is done more special by the uh, flatty bones. Then, storage for minerals and endocrine regulation. So, these are the functions of the human skeleton. Then let's see about the structure of a bone. On a cut surface, the bone portrays two forms. The bone has the compact bone or the outer solid layer, sometimes called as the cortical layer, that is a compact bone. And then we have cancellous or sponge bone, that is inner trabecular layer, softer and more porous. It has the spaces filled with bone marrow. In the flat bones of scar, they attempt the deploy. They attempt the z deploy. So bone actually bone has two parts: compact bone and sponge bone. Uh, the compact bone is the solid outer mass. Sponge bone is the one which is more porous, soft, and it is filled with the bony marrow. So we have the membrane uh, covering the bone by outside. It is called the periosteum. Membrane that covers the bone externally, periosteum, and we have endosteum which is the membrane that covers the bone internally. These membranes contain osteoprogenic cells. Osteoprogenic cells, they are important in the bone healing. Uh, if you hear about the osteoprogenic cells, these are cells which can, can regenerate themselves or they can, they can reproduce themselves by mitosis to form the new bone cells. So osteoprogenic cells, they are stem cells of the bones so this is the diagram which shows the structure of the bone here we have the outer covering of the bone which is called the periosteum then you have the veins these veins they supply the uh, the nutrients and oxygen to the bone you have the veins then you have the artery as you can see this which is in red carries the artery and the veins they they are running parallel to each other then you have osteocytes osteocytes these are cells of the bone we have osteocytes, then you have the sponge bone here, uh, which has more species and the species they are fed by the bony marrow. Uh, so in the structure of the bone, all of this part from here uh, to here, it is regarded as the compact bone. From here to here, the compact bone. And from here to there, the spongy bone. So this, this is how the appearance of the bone. And this figure here the magnification of the piece of the bone there so we have the inside of the bone and then you have the outside of the of the bone uh, these structure here which are sacra they are called as a Havesian canal Havesian canal so Havesian canal they have the uh, it is the canal which allow the blood vessels to th to pass through the compact bone and the blood vessels passing through the uh, the Havesian canal they supply the nutrient and the oxygen to the to the bone so from there in the flat bones as you can see here one among the types of uh, flat bone uh, is present in the scar so in flat bones we have the sponge bone which are called the diploid and we shall study later that in, uh, the function of producing the blood cells such as red blood cell in the adult human it is uh, taken by the by the flat bones so this is simply the diagram which illustrates the the compact and the, the compact and the sponge bone. Also, this diagram illustrates the structure of the bone. As you can see, here we have the periosteum, which is the outer covering. Then here by inside we have the endosteum. Then at, in between here we have the yellow bony marrow. So we have the compact bone by outside. Then you have the sponge bone. Uh, sponge bone which is fed by the bony marrow. The periosteum is the outer covering of the bone 
and it is where the blood vessels they enter through the bone and then they they are uh, they they supply the bone through the avesian canal as we have seen in the previous diagram so you can see nutrient arteries perforating fibers of the periosteum then you have periosteum you have compact bone you have yellow bone marrow and then you have endosteum which is the membrane covering the bone by inside so periosteum and endosteum in the long bone they appear in diagram like this so here we have also the diagram of a flat bone and as you can see we have the endosteum endosteum the membrane covering the bone by inside then you have the sponge bone which is called diploe in these flat bones then you have compact bone as you can see here uh, in the peripheral we have compact bone then in between here we have the sponge bone then the periosteum is the one which uh, covers uh, the uh, this flat bones by outside so all of these three diagrams they explain about the structure of the bone now let's see about the development or growth of a bone how the bone develops uh, bone is developed in two processes we have membranous ossification and we have endochondral ossification so actually the process of development of a bone from either a membrane or from either a cartilage it is called ossification so actually ossification is the process of growth of a bone is called ossification and we have two types of ossification that is membranous and endochondral so membranous a bone developed directly from a connective tissue membrane such as the bones of skull or valve so most of the flat bones they are membranous bones uh, they have developed from the from the connective tissue membranes and the endochondral ossification a bone develops from a cartilage such as the long bones of the limb so most of the long bones they are made up from the cartilage and they are called as the endochondral ossification endochondral ossification and as we discussed in the previous session that the chondro means cartilage so if you if you can if you review my previous session you will you will remember that the chondro means cartilage so endochondral means the development of the bone endochondral ossification the development of the bone from the cartilage now structurally the long bones of the following parts uh, we have first the part which is called the diaphysis diaphysis in other name is called as the shaft now diaphysis is the center of the bone formation found in the shaft it has a thick outer compact bone that is the diaphysis from the diaphysis we have epiphysis epiphysis is the proximal and the distal rounded parts of the bone it contains a large amount of spongy bone that is epiphysis so uh, another part is uh, metaphysis metaphysis is the wide portion of diaphysis that lies adjacent to the epiphyseal plate epiphyseal plate so uh, we have also what you call as the epiphyseal plate or growth plate now epiphyseal plate is the plate of cartilage at each end of the growing bone lying between the epiphysis and the diaphysis so epiphyseal plate is primarily concerned with growth in length that is longitudinal direction the plate is found in children and adolescent in adult who have stopped growing between 18 and 20 years the plate is replaced by epiphyseal line so all of the epiphyseal plate is converted into a bone now you can see uh, the composition of the parts of the long bone as you can see uh, for example this this is one among the example for long bone which is femur femur the bone of the thigh so here in the point where the femur is connected to the hip bone and here at the point where the femur is connected to the bones of the legs so as you can see we have epiphysis epiphysis here so epiphysis as you can see is the part of the bone which is in uh, is the part of bone which is enlarged and it is in on the end side of the bone so epiphysis is here and also we have another epiphysis here then from epiphysis we have metaphysis you see and then from metaphysis we have uh, diaphysis or we have shaft so all of these in the shaft all of this part of the shaft then you have the 
medullary cavity uh, medullary cavity then you have compact bone so as you can see this diagram does not show the epiphyseal plate but let me show you in the in the next diagram which is this one uh, this diagram shows the epiphyseal plate and the growth of the bone so for example here we have this which is the joint and then we have the epithelial plate here so new cartilage forms on this side so in the epiphyseal plate uh, the bone tend to grow here in the epiphyseal plate so below here at the point where the cartilage is converted into bone and then above here is the point where the new cartilage forms so the mechanism of a person to become taller uh, or the mechanism of a person hands to become longer it is through the growth of the long bones of the leg and of the upper limb which is taking place through the epiphyseal plate now on reaching the age of 18 to 20 years the growth of, of epiphyseal plate stops uh, all of the epiphyseal plate is already converted into a bone and then what remains is simply an epiphyseal line so you can see uh, this is the x-ray film of the x-ray film of the lower limb and you can see this is the epiphysis this is the metaphysis this is diaphysis then you have the the growth plate so after the year of 18 to 20 years all of this uh, all of this epiphyseal plate is converted into epiphyseal line so what remains here is just the line which showed that uh, here is where the growth took place but epiphyseal plate uh, actually it, it disappears so as you can see here you have the epiphyseal plate of femur then you have epiphyseal plate of tibia this is the x-ray film of the lower limb so uh, we should know about the clinical notes on the part of the development of the bones and the mechanisms of ossification we should know about the clinical notes First, we have uh, rickets. Rickets. Uh, rickets is the defective mineralization of the cartilage matrix in the growing bone. As we said, that uh, long bones they are made up of the uh, cartilaginous, uh, I mean, endochondral ossification. And in the endochondral ossification, the bones they are made up of the, uh, they are made up from the cartilages. So, as we said before, that. Uh, uh, bones they are hard because of the calcification and calcium in the mineral so sometimes the ineffective mineralization or ineffective calcification of the bones uh, lead them to be still soft now being soft they can lead to uh, poor support to the body and they can bend now this produces a condition in which the cartilage cell continue to grow resulting in excess cartilage and widening of the epithelial plate so widening of the epiphyseal plate means the epiphyseal plate is becoming longer than its normal width so the poor poorly mineralized the cartilage cartilaginous matrix and the osteoid matrix are soft and they bend under the stress of bearing weight that means the bone failed to support the weight of the and this normally occur in in babies so the bone failed to support the weight uh uh, fail to support the weight of the baby so the bones tend to, to bend that's why these rickets normally occur in the lower limb because they fail to support the weight of the baby so the resulting deformity including enlarged costochondrial junction bowing of the long legs of the lower limb and this is what the common feature of the rickets and the bruising of the frontal bones of the skull so the common feature of rickets is bowing of the legs of the lower limb. As you can see here, uh, the epiphyseal plate has been elongated or has been widened. So this is not the normal width of the epiphyseal plate. And this has led to the bowing of the legs of the lower limb. So all of these legs, they show bowing. This are uh, the stretch of the normal, of the normal bone. Normal bone, you see, it is straight. Uh, but in the presence of rickets, uh, the the bones they tend to bow or they tend to to bend and as you can see the matrix of a solid bone and of a weakened bone uh, the matrix of a weakened bone is more porous as compared to the matrix of a solid bone that means 
uh, the matrix which is more porous will fail to support the body and hence will lead to the bending of the bones which we call it as in rickets. So this is the physical appearance of a baby with a, a baby with rickets are uh, the bowing of bones uh, they lead to appearance like this of a baby and this is the x-ray of a baby with rickets x-ray of a baby with the, with rickets so from there uh, let's continue to discuss about the clinical nurse and another uh, another clinical case is the epiphysioplate disorder epiphysioplate disorders affecting only children and the adolescent because as we t as i told you before that he, in adult the epiphysioplate uh, disappears and is converted into bone so a clinical condition which affects the growth of epiphysioplates include trauma that is injury uh, infections uh, diet exercise endocrine disorders all of these may lead to deformities and the loss of function of the of the long bones uh, I can give you the one among the example uh, in the production of more pituitary gland. More pituitary gland uh, can lead to long bones to become longer than uh, than normal and is called as gigantism. So that is the endocrine disorder. It's called as gigantism. A, a person becomes very long than normal. That is overproduction of the pituitary gland. But uh, well, uh, as compared to the factors uh, mentioned here, trauma, infection, diet, we have different deformities of the epiphyseal plate. From there, let's see about the uh, growth plate fracture. Growth plate fracture, that, is mean, that means the trauma on the epiphyseal plate. So it's common among childhood injuries. Risky growth plate are still growing the weakest area of the growing skeleton. Two to five times weaker than adjacent ligaments. This is due to the connective tissues need, needing to grow for the growth of the bones, needing to allow for growth of the bones. So the connective tissues at the uh, growth plate, they are soft as compared to the connective tissues in the limb bone. Why? Because the connective tissues in the growing region, uh, they are required for the bone to continue to grow. So once growth has stopped, once close at this top the physioplate is replaced with a solid bone through calcification and cases to be an area of weakness. So after the age of 18 or 20 years, all of the physioplate has already been uh, replaced by a bone and we have no region of weakness again. So here this is the physioplate and in the region of weakness uh, if the child undergoes falls uh, can lead to an easier bone fracture in this region of weakness that is a uh, growth plate fracture so chemical composition of a bone let's move to the another part chemical composition of a bone a uh, bone is made up of organic and inorganic sorts in organic when organic materials of the bone we have collagen and elastic fibers then in organic sorts we have minerals such as calcium, phosphate and then hydroxopatate. So we have uh, organic and inorganic components of the bone. Then from there let's move to the types of the bone. Bones they are classified to the major five types. Major five types. First is the long bones. First is the long bones and generally the bones they are classified by their shape. So long bones are they are, they are longer as compared to their width. And these include the humerus, the ladius, ana, metacarpals, femur, tibia, fibula, uh, metatarsals, and the phalanges. So we shall lead this in this session. So don't worry if you don't know about any bone, don't worry. And then we have the short bones. Short bone, we have carpals and the tarsals. These are just examples. We have flat bones. For example, you have cranial bones, uh, scapula, sternum, ribs, and the innominate. From there, we have irregular bones, such as vertebral, uh, temporal, sphenoid, ethmoid, zygomatic, maxilla, mandible, palatine, and inferior nasal concha. Inferior nasal concha. Also, we have sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bones, uh, these are the bones embedded in a tendon, such as the patella, such as patella. So, 
let's start seeing about one type of bone after another. So first is the long bone. Long bones are found in the limbs. Are found in the limbs such as humerus, femur, metacarpus, metatarsus, and pharynges. So their length is greater than their breadth or width. That's why they are called as long bones. So their length is greater than their the width. They have a tubular shaft or the diaphysis and usually an epiphysis at each end. As we know that epiphysis contains the visual plate which allows the growth of the long bones. During the growing phase, the diaphysis is separated from the epiphysis by epiphysial cartilage, or in other words we call it as epiphysial plate. The part of the diaphysis that lies adjacent to the epiphysial cartilage is called the metaphysis, as we discussed in the previous slides. So the shaft or diaphysis has a central marrow cavity containing bone marrow. The outer part of the shaft is composed of the compact bone that is covered by the connective sheath called the periosteum. All of these facts we have already discussed them in the previous slides. Uh, the end, uh, the ends epiphysis of the long bones are composed of castellar's bone, that means sponge bones surrounded by a thin layer of compact bone. The articular surface of the end of the bones are covered by hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage. So don't worry, we will discuss all of these aspects in more detail in the next slides. Then you have short bones. Short bones are found in hands and foot. You have the scaphoid, lunate, talus, and calcaneum. So they are laugh, lovely cuboidal. Roughly cuboid in shape. So their shape is like cube, uh, cubic and they are composed of cancellous bone surrounded by a thin layer of compact bone. Short bones are covered with periosteum and the articular surface are covered by hyaline cartilage. That's all about short bones. We have flat bones. Flat bones are found in the vault that is the skull. Uh, for example, in the frontal and the parietal bones. They are composed of two layers of compact bone called tablets, thin inner and outer tablets separated by a layer of cancellous bone that is called the diploe. Come over to me discuss when you previous slides. Then the scapula also the flat bone. So the scapula, although irregular, are included in this group. So we shall see later what is the scapula, how does it appear. Then from there we have irregular bones, irregular bones, irregular bones they include those which are not assigned to the previous groups, the bones of the scar, the vertebra and the pelvic bones. So irregular bones actually they, they do not have a specific shape and they are composed of thin shell of compact bone within an interior made up of the cancellous bone. So actually irregular bones they don't have the specific shape. Even the even the uh, the even the the bones of the shoulder, I mean the scapula, has no specific shape, but it is classified in flat bones. So, irregular bones, they are many actually. They are many uh, bones of the scar, as they have been mentioned before. Then some of them they are bones of the pelvis, and some of them they are bones of the vertebra. Also we have sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bones, they are bones which are embedded in the tendon. So sesamoid bones are small nodules of bone that are found in certain tendons where they rub over bone surface. The greater part of sesamoid bone is buried in the tendon and the free surface is covered with cartilage. So the largest sesamoid bone is the patella. Patella which is located in the tendon of uh, quadriceps femoris. Quadriceps femoris is the name of the muscle present in the lower limb. We shall study later uh, in, in the lower limb. Then we shall see in detail about the patella and about the quadriceps femoris tendon. Other examples are found in the tendons of the flexor pollicis brevis and flexor halusis brevis. So we shall study later, you know all of these muscles where are they present and what are their function. The function of sesamoid bones is to reduce friction on the tendon. 
it can also alter the direction of pull of a tendon. So as you can see, this diagram illustrates here are different types of bones. Here we have the parietal bone, which is example of the flat bone. We have the external table, uh, the diploe, which is the sponge bone of the flat bone. Then you have the internal table. Also, we have the long bones here. Our example here is the humerus. Um, and according to this bone, we have the end, which is connected to the shoulder here. We have the head of humerus, which is connected to the shoulder. And then we have this end of humerus, which is connected to the radius and the ulna. Then you have sesamoid bones. Here, our example is patella. And this is how uh, the patella appears. We have the short bones, and our example is the carpus bones uh, of the upper limb, and this is how they appear. Then you have the irregular bones, our example is it, vertebra. Irregular bone, our example is vertebra. So, as you can see in this diagram, uh, bone type, then structure, then uh, here we have function, and then you have example. For example, a uh, long bone. These bones are longer than the, they are wider. So they are longer than wide structure. Uh, they have diaphysis, two epiphysis, uh, most compact bone with the sponge bone at the end. Function uh, act as the levels and the shock absorber. Uh, example, the bones of the thigh, leg, toe, upper arm, forearm, and finger. Then you have short bones. Short bones, these are almost cube shaped. Most cube shaped. And if you see here, in the structure, there are sponge bones covered by a thin layer of compact bone. Then in function, some sesamoid, uh, sesamoid come to the and special type of short bone are going to be embedded in the tendon. And the sesamoid bones to the same as can change the direction of pull of a tendon. Like in, in short bone, in Guinea, there are two cars that support, uh, could support then we have bones in the wrist I mean example the bones in the wrist and the ankles so also this diagram continues to explain the, the type of bones we have the flat bones uh, in the scar and the structure the middle layer of spongy bone a layer of compact bone on each side of the spongy bone uh, function they provide the anchor point for muscles and protect organs for example, in the scar, ribs, sternum, hips, scapula, and the shoulder blade. Uh, uh, scapula is sometimes known as shoulder blade. Also, we have irregular bones. These do, uh, these do not fit into any of the above category. Uh, mainly, they have uh, sponge bone, thin layer of compact bone. Proportion of sponge uh, to located bone varies. Uh, proportion of sponge to compact bone varies. In the function of the irregular bones, their function varies. And the example, the vertebrae of the spine and the fascial bones. Also, yeah, this simply the end of the explanation about the types of bones. And I hope we are together that there are five types of bones. And I hope you have already understood the basis of classification of the bones. And then now let's go to see about the surface markings, surface mas markings of the bone. So actually, each bone or every bone had the surface markings. Surface marking is simply like elevations uh, and points in the bone where the uh, different muscles ligament, tendons, fascia, apneurosis, they attach. So uh, the surface marking, the surface of a bone show various markings or irregularities where bands of fascia, ligament, tendon or apneurosis attach to the bone. The surface is raised or roughened. So the surface becomes rough or raised. So these Rough, these these roughenings are not present at birth. They appear at puberty and become progressively more obvious during adult life. Kwa hiyo, hicho ndicho ambacho nakisema kuhusu surface marking the bones. Kwa mba at birth, 
who are zipper. So in certain situations, the surface markings are large and they are given special names. Some of the more important markings are summarized in the table below. So uh, some of the more important markings, we have elevations, then you have expanded ends and small flat areas for articulations, we have depressions and we have openings. So for example in this table we have linear elevation. Here we have the bone marking then example. Linear elevation, for example, a line. Example for a line is superior neutral line of the occipital bone. So actually I'm just explaining here but uh, without uh, knowing even the diagram of a of a occipital bone it is very difficult for me to to tell you about the superior neutral line of the occipital bone but one thing you need to know about osteology and even the rule of the gross anatomy it is very important for you to use atlas it's very important for you to use the netas atlas in the best book which uh, it's very important for you to understand and more special is the bones and the muscles even the arrangement of other structures also you have the ridge ridge the linear elevation and for example the medial and the lateral supracondyral ridge of the humerus media and the lateral supracondyral ridge of the humerus then you have crest for example is iliac crest of the hip bone iliac crest of the hip bone then you have rounded elevations for example a tubercle a tubercle example is the tubic uh, i mean a pubic tubercle then you have protubercle example is external occipital protuberance i mean protuberance it's not protubercle it's a protuberance then you have uh, tuberosity tuberosity for example is greater and lesser tuberosity of humerus greater and lesser tuberosity of humerus then you have malleolus example is medial malleolus of the tibia and the lateral malleolus of fibula present in the legs then we have trochanter trochanter for example is greater and lesser trochanters of the femur greater and lesser trochanter of the femur we have sharp elevations example is spine or spinous process uh, here uh, I mean this the name of the elevation spine or spinous process example is ischial spine spine of the vertebra and then we have styroid process this is present in the temporal bone thyroid process of the temporal bone we have the expanded ends of the articulation we have head example is head of humerus or head of femur we have condyle example is medial and lateral condyles of femur we have epicondyle that is a prominence situated just above condyle epi epi means above so epicondyle are uh, the prominence situated above the condyle we have medial and lateral epicondyle of femur then you have small flat areas of articulation for example we call them as facet example is a facet on the head of rib for articulation with the vertebral body then you have depressions uh, such as notch notch examples is greater sciatic notch of the hip bone depression so this is the depression which allow the sciatic node to to pass uh, near the hip bone then you have grooves or sulcus example is bicipital groove of humerus bicipital groove of humerus uh, then you have fossa fossa is also a depression for example, is all the cranon force of humerus and the acetabular force of the hip bone. So all of th all of these are they have different names. For example, all of these three, they are depressions, but they are di they have different names because of different natures of the depressions. Then you have opening openings. Uh, one type of opening is called fissure. Fissure example is superior orbital fissure. We have foramen, for example, is the inflobito foramen of the maxilla, and we have a cano, example, is the carotid cano of the temporal bone. So, let's see in detail some of the common uh, 
features or surface marking of the bones. These are very important because if you'd be asked that where maybe a certain nerve passes, you should know that it passes through a certain kernel. Or where does a certain muscle uh, attaches, you should know that it attaches to a certain line. So very important to, to understand about the surface markings of the of the bone. So first let's see about the elevations. We have linear elevations, that is lines or ridges such as the neutral line and supracondyro ridge. Neutral line and supracondyro ridge. We have crests such as the prominent line or ridge. So almost all of these all of these are elevations we have discussed them in the table. Uh, tubercle, uh, protuberancy, then uh, tuberosity, trochanter, malleolus, sharp elevations such as pinus process and the styroid process. We have already discussed them. Uh, expanded ends and small flat areas of articulation. Uh, for example, facet. Facet is small, smooth, flat articular surface. And for example, these they appear in the ribs, head and the condyle, rounded articular surface, normally covered by cartilage such as the head of humerus and the condyle femur, uh, epicondyle, prominent process just above the condyle. Almost all of these we have already discussed them in the table. Uh, Groove or sulcus, shallow and long depression in the bone surface. Fossa, the deep depression in the bone surface. Notch, uh, then you have fissure, we have foramen, fissure the superior. Uh, example, the superior beta fissure, we have uh, Fissure, we have uh, foramen opening of the holes, we have cano, we have uh, meatus. So now let's see about the features, how are they observed in the real bone. If we go to the practical sessions in the laboratory, you will see these bones and then you will be asked what these are uh, called. Then uh, your teacher can ask you what are they called. So for example, this is the humerus, the bone of the upper limb the bone of the upper limb and as you can see this uh, this feature here is called as the head head of humerus so the head attaches to the shoulder attaches to the shoulder so this is the head of humerus then you have greater trochanter greater trochanter here is the lesser trochanter so greater trochanter is here lesser trochanter is here then from there you see there is anatomical neck of the humerus. Then there is the surgical neck. It is very important. When we be discussing about the upper limb, you will see uh, what is the major difference about the anatomical and the surgical neck. But actually, in that uh, one among the point here, the weakest point where the uh, the uh, the when the accident occur, the bone can break. So actually, we have the greater tubercle. As you can see, this is the tubercle. We have the head, uh, anatomical neck, and the uh, surgical neck. We have the greater tubercle and lesser tubercle. Then, between the greater and lesser tubercle, we have the intertubercular groove. And all of these, they are named as elevations. Then, you have deltoid tuberosity. You see, deltoid tuberosity. We have the coronoid fossa. Coronoid fossa. You have the Caputulum, we have the trochlea, then medial epicondyle. Medial epicondyle. So on the other side, you have lateral epicondyle. Then you have oleclanony fossa. So uh, sometimes it is very difficult for most of people to understand these concepts. But here, this is the front front side of the of the bone. So coronary fossa, it is present in the front. But the oleclanony fossa, it is present on the uh, behind. So, for example, if we go to the laboratory sessions, you will be asked: uh, Is this bone of the is this bone of the right or left arm? Uh, actually, for this bone here, this is the bone of the left arm, because if you place it in the shoulder of a person, assuming uh, the olecranon fossa will appear to be backward, and then the lateral tuberosity will appear to be laterally this is the deltoid tuberosity also the glitter and lesser trochanter glitter appear laterally glitter trochanter appear laterally and the lesser trochanter appears if it is anterior so 
uh, position of the Oriclan on Fosa, lateral epicondyle and medial epicondyle. Actually, they tell me that if this is the lateral side of the bone and if this is the medial side of the bone, then I am I already know that in from my knowledge of anatomy, I already know Oriclan on Fosa appears behind the bone. Now, this actually the bone of the left hand side because if you try to put it on the right hand side the olecrano nifosa will appear on the front the medial and the lateral epicondyle they can remain the same but the olecrano nifosa will appear on the front and even the greater trochanter will uh, will try to, to appear as if it is in the front while where it is it is actually either we can say it is as laterally or we can say as it is lateral posterior that means in between of the lateral and the posterior so actually this is the bone of the left arm the bone of the left arm but if you see uh even at this bone even at this bone this is also the left arm because if you try to place it on the right arm it will appear uh, that the coronary fossa will appear on the on the front of the arm that's uh, on the behind of the arm that is not correct I mean posterior because if you press this bone on the right arm or uh, the coronary fossa will appear posterior because it, it will stay as how it is but if you press this bone on the left arm you should rotate it and the coronary fossa will appear uh, anterior so you should be able to know if this bone is of the right hand or of the left hand then from there, this is also the uh, the picture of the of another bone. Uh, this is the humerus. I mean, this is the femur of the lower limb. And here we have the neck of femur. We have the neck. We have the fovea head. Then you have the head. Actually, this is the head of femur. Then you have the lesser trochanter. We have the intertrochanter line we have the greater trochanter we have the shafty then you have the adductor adductor tubercle we have the medial epicondyle medial condyle so you see we have condyle then you have epicondyle so epicondyle means above condyle we have patellar surface then lateral condyle uh, and the lateral epicondyle so for example if you ask me this bone is of the left or right leg the correct answer here is that the bone is of the uh, of the right leg. Actually, uh, this is because the patellar surface here is is in, in the front side. So actually, the bone is of the right leg. So from there, let's continue to see uh, other features of the bones as you can see this is how the crest appears from here to here all of this it is called as crest and then you have the fossa here even this is also the fossa this is the crest then you have the pubic tubercle which is present here then this is called pubic uh, pubic crest so here we have the pubic symphysis and we will see later how uh, this structure they are they are named the different elevations of the bone so as you can see uh, this is the scar and then you have the sphenoid bone we have the optic canal so you, you see there is a canal here through the the bone through the sphenoid bone is called the optic canal. We have the superior bit of fissure. Uh, then you have other bones they are named here. Then you have infraorbital foramen, uh, supraorbital foramen, supraorbital foramen present in the frontal bone. So I am just trying to show you some of the uh, surface markings of the cell. These are the bones of the scar. But if you we'll, uh, read the atlas or if you we'll visit the atlas, you will see many of these uh, structures. Then from there now, uh, let's go to discuss about the bone marrow. Bone marrow occupies the bone cavity in the long and short bones. And the instatites of the cancellous bone in the flat and the regular bones. We have major two types of bone marrow, which are red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. At birth, 
the mal of all bones of the body is ready and hematopoietic produces red blood cell, white blood cell and platelets. Uh, this blood forming activity gradually lessens with age. Kwa hiyo in birth all of the uh, bone marrow is ready. However as the as the child grows uh, the function of the many of the bones uh, to produce red blood cell uh, declines and the red bone marrow is replaced by the yellow bone marrow. So at seven years, seven years of age, yellow bone marrow begin to appear in the distal bones of the limbs. Distal bones of the limbs. So in the adult, red bone marrow is restricted to the flat bones, such as those of the scar, thoracic cage, and the vertebral column, the guido bones, and the head of the humerus and the femur. Yellow bone marrow produces fat, cartilage, and bone. It gets, uh, it gets its yellow color from the carotenoids in the fat droplets in the high number of fat cells. So that's bony marrow and as you can see this is in hematopoietic bony marrow at the head of uh, at the head of femur hematopoietic bony marrow it releases hematopoietic stem cells and they can differentiate into uh, red blood cells can differentiate to uh, white blood cells and platelets. So uh, in this as a osteology we don't study we don't study in detail but we study in, in hematology about these types of cells and the, about their function. So this is how the red bone marrow is replaced by the yellow bone marrow in the shaft of the long bones especially those of the upper limb and those of the lower limb. And then uh, regional classification of the bones. So as I told you before in the starting of the session that we have 206 bones in the body. So in the skull we have cranial bones which are 80. Then you have face bones which are 14. We have auditory oscos which are 6 in number. We have hyoid bone which is 1 in number. Then from there we have vertebra including sacrum and cogito. Uh, the year 26 uh, then you have um, sternum which is one and then you have ribs which are 24 in number that means 12 in the left hand side and 12 in the or that means the year 12 pairs in the appendicular skeleton uh, in shoulder guido you have clavicle which are two in number that means left and light one left and one light uh, clavicle there are two bones in the upper extremity you have uh, Humerus, which are two bones, radius two bones, ulna two bones, then you have couples, 16 bones, uh, metacarpals 10 bones, and the phalanges, 28 bones. So it's uh, not so much important to know about these, but sometimes you can be asked in MCQ questions. So it's better if you pass through them and you know them. Also in the pelvic guido, we have hip bones, which are two bones. We have lower extremity, a femur, two bones, patella, two bones, fibula two bones, tibia two bones, tarsus fourteen bones, metatarsus ten bones, and phalanges they are twenty eight bones, making a total of two hundred and sixty bones. So that is the uh, the human skeleton and we have already discussed the, uh, this uh, almost most of the structure of bone, how are they composed, the functions and the arrangement we have already discussed the most of this human skeleton and this is the scar as you can see this is the parietal bone this is the occipital bone you have temporal bone and you have frontal bone um, from here we have the frontal then you have sphenoid we have ethmoid we have nasal zygomatic maxilla and mandible so some of these bones they are called as cranial and some of them they are they are named as uh, the fascial bones so also we have the hyoid bone hyoid bone is located here um, at the neck you have the hyoid bone and here as you can see this is the larynx larynx so this is the appearance of a hyoid bone or in the diagram it is drawn like this it has a body it has a racer corn and it has glitter corn uh, this is the appearance of a hyoid bone Hyoid bone acts as the attachment of many of the 
uh, muscles muscles of the of the neck and these muscles they tend to divide the the neck into different triangles as we shall study later in the session of the head and neck but uh, we have the steroid process here and from here from the steroid process some of the muscles they are extending from the steroid process to the uh, to the hyoid bone here and here we have the uh, styrohyoid bone styrohyoid ligament we have styrohyoid ligament we have styrohyoid muscle we have digastric muscle uh, then we have um, digastric styrohyoid then we have um, thyrohyoid so as you can see thi thyrohyoid means it connects between thyroid uh, thyroid present in the thyroid cartilage and the the hyoid bone so that's why it's called thyrohyoid ligament then you have styro means it runs from the steroid process to the uh, hyoid bone styrohyoid then you have digastric muscle and the digastric muscle it's called digastric because it has uh, two bellies it has one belly which is here and the another belly is here that's why it's called digastric uh, and this is the anterior belly of the digastric muscle where the are the posterior belly of the digastric muscle there so from there we have uh, we have also the uh, stylohyoid muscle so this is the anterior belly of digastric muscle posterior belly of digastric muscle stylohyoid muscle and stylohyoid ligament they are running from the hyoid process I mean steroid process to the hyoid bone from there we have the ribs and sternum here is the sternum and here we have the ribs uh, from rib number 1 to rib number 12 uh, rib number 11 and 12 they are called sometimes called as hanging ribs because or floating ribs because uh, actually they did not connect themselves to the sternum so we shall see later about the ribs their classification and the criteria of the ribs when we'll be dis discussing about the thorax about the thorax then from there uh, this is the spine and as you can see spine has uh, different regions as you can see it, it appears as SC it has bent C but it has different regions we have our first region is cervical our cervical region has upper C1 and C2 uh, which uh, have special names axis and uh, atlas and axis as we shall study later in the head and neck the c1 and c2 they are special and they have different features com compared to the c c3 to c7 then from there we have t1 to t2 that is thoracic uh thoracic vertebra then we have lumbar from lumbar 1 to lumbar 5 then we have sacrococcygeo that is nine fused vertebra in the sacramonde uh coccyx so also we have the bones of the upper limb as you can see here the clavicle here the scapula and then we have the humerus here we have the ulna we have the ulna and then you have the radius there we have the carpus metacarpus and the pharynges all of these we shall study them in detail when we'll be discussing about these parts of the body we have the bones of the lower limb which we have the hip bone we have the femur then you have patella uh sesame bone here we have the tibia we have fibula and the tassels metatarsals and the phalanges so I'm going first but we discuss all of these bones in the respective uh, respective topics then from there let's uh, discuss a little about the clinical notes this is a very important session because in anatomy uh, you need to know how to link the anatomy or the structure of the body organ and it's a, it is a, a disease condition so in clinical notes first we have the bone fracture bone fracture a fracture in the bo a broken bone it can range from a, a thin crack to a complete brick bone can fracture crosswise lengthwise in several places or into many pieces fracture of a bone is accompanied by injuries to the surrounding structure such as blood vessels nerves and muscles there is considerably hemorrhage of blood between the bone and and into the surrounding of the soft tissues also come a bone fracture involved nerves that can lead to paralysis or different kinds of disorders so as you can see uh, different types of the bone fracture 
for example we have simple transverse fracture we have the spiral fracture uh, we have oblique fracture as you can see here we have longitudinal fracture as you can see here then we have uh, comminuted fracture as you can see here uh, we have the impacted here as you can see here the bone of uh, the head of femur has broken there to the neck impacted then you have depressed so these are just uh, different types of uh, fracture of bones for example here the structure of ulna and this is the x-ray x-ray image which show the fracture of ulna also here we have the x-ray images uh, showing the fracture of tibia and the fibula uh, both together at the same time the uh, the fracture of tibia and fibula this is how they are uh, x-ray diffraction uh, they appear I mean this is how the x-ray imaging they appear and actually normally this uh, occur in the major accident if someone gets an accident of a motorcycle or accident of a car then bone fracture of this can 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 happen from there we have the bone tumors bone tumors bone tumors are common examples include benign tumor uh, such as osteoma osteochondroma and the osteoblastoma also we have the malignant malignant primary bone tumor or cancer such as the osteosarcoma chondrosarcoma and the Ewing's sarcoma also we have fibrosarcoma so malignance is the cancer but benign is just uh, the accumulation abnormal accumulation of cells so benign has no major effect as compared to malignant and benign cannot spread from one body part to another but malignant they can spread from one body part to another and they can seed or they can grow to uh, the next part of the body so malignant they are cancers and they are they have ability to metastasize that is to spread to other sites of the body and they have more effect also malignant they grow more rapidly as compared to the benign uh, tumors so for example here we have the cancer of, of femur cancer of femur this is bone cancer and here is the cancer of radius this is the x-ray film so actually if you don't know about cancer cancer is the abnormal proliferation of cells abnormal proliferation of cells so as you can see in this image here this is just abnormal proliferation of cells uh, sometimes these cells they can be maybe they have metastasized from one side of the body then they go to seed in the bone or sometimes they can originate there by types such as mutation and processes like uh, x-ray and radiations they can they can cause mutation of cells and then at the end of the day we are ending up to the uh, cancers cells to be grown then we have osteoporosis and dislocations uh, in the osteoporosis uh, the bones become more porous and it becomes very easier to to break it this normally occur for the women who have already passed past the menopause that means they have stopped the uh, menstruating why this normally occur because there is a link between the estrogen and the growth of bones in a female so uh, the lack of estrogen in females lead to the uh, improper compactness of the bone and thus making the bone more spongy and very easier to break then dislocations means the joint position of one bone and another uh, is not as how it was required to to stay at the joint so maybe the uh, position or the articulation articulation of one bone and another at the joint if they are they are uh, they are not correctly placed the that is what you call as the dislocation as we shall study in detail later in the next sessions so let's touch a little about the cartilage cartilage is the form of connective tissue which is composed of cells fibers and gel like matrix uh, in the cartilage we have perichondrium uh, which is the fibrous membrane that cover the cartilage except in the exposed surface of the joint 
there are three types of cartilage uh, which are hyaline cartilage uh, throughout childhood and adolescent it plays an important part in growth in length of the long bones that is hyaline cartilage it has greater resistance to wear and cover the articular surface of the nearly all synovial joints. So hyaline cartilage also is incapable of repair when fractured. The defect is filled with a fibrous tissue. So that is hyaline cartilage. From there we have fibrocartilage, has many collagen fibers embedded in a small amount of matrix and is found in the disc within the joint, such as temporal mandibular joint and sternoclavicular joint and knee joint. And on the articular surface of the clavicle and the man, mandibo. So, unakomba the fibers cartilage pia iko kwenye joints. Na kazi yake ni ile ile, ile ile ya ku prevent au ku reduce friction. Lakini fibro cartilage if damaged it, has, it can repair. It has the ability to repair itself slowly in a manner similar to fi, uh, fibrous tissue as well in the body. However, as we uh, we, we said before, that the the hyaline cartilage they can't repair themselves. So from fibrocartilage, you have elastic cartilage, possess a large number of elastic fiber embedded in the matrix. It is flexible and it is found in the uh, at auricle of the ear, external auditory meatus, the auditory tube, and the epiglottis. So the external, uh, I mean the external auditory meatus is sometimes called as the external ear. So if you touch this ear and you see it see soft, that's because it's made up of the elastic fiber, uh, elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage is the main uh, repairs itself within with the fibrous tissue. Hyaline cartilage and fibro cartilage tend to classify or even ossify in later life. So calcify means they become hard, ossify means they are changed into bone in later life. So this diagram shows the hyaline cartilage here at the head of, of femur. And from there, this marks the end of this session. In the next session, we'll be discussing about arthrology. Arthrology, the study of joints, its types, and their functions, also the clinical conditions associated with the joints. Thank you everybody. Let me wish you nice studies.